It's an unsettled time in the United States. The very foundations of the Republic have been taking a beating. US politics is ugly, and America's social fabric is being frayed by division and distrust. Over the last couple of months, Americans have been graphically reminded just how close the country came to a coup. On January the 6th last year, the day set down for the certification of Joe Biden's election win, the US government was on the verge of falling. An angry mob of Donald Trump supporters stormed the US Congress. The congressional inquiry into the chain of events that day has revealed in at times terrifying detail how the then president whipped the protesters into a frenzy. We fight. We fight like hell. And for more than three hours, did nothing to stop the violence. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. January 6th was the culmination of an attempted coup. The revelations from the January the 6th hearings may damage Donald Trump or steal the 74 million Americans who voted for him in 2020. He's dismissed the inquiry as a witch hunt and has sought to discredit the Republican officials and staffers who've testified against him. Whatever the outcome, the country is polarised and on a perilous political path approaching the key midterm elections in November and then the 2024 contest for the White House. It sucks. <laughs> to put it just very bluntly, it sucks. Fear and anger will win the day. I think that Trump has created a whole new level of animosity. And there's just a deep divide about what it means to be American in this country. And so we have a tug of war over that right now inside our nation. It is something of a truism that America is a divided country. Conflict and discord were well entrenched when I was working here as an ABC correspondent in the Bush and Obama years. But more recently, things have taken a sharp turn for the worse. Look no further than the attack on the US Capitol at the start of last year. Yes, American politics is broken, but the divisions extend well beyond this city, encompassing race, guns, abortion, even geography. I've been in the US Capitol, tapping the political mood, looking at how the country got to this point and what lies ahead. <laughs> It's a sultry Saturday morning in Washington, a day when the political games that grip this city are swapped for the real thing. Down on the National Mall, after a couple of COVID-disrupted summers, the tourists are flocking back. But amid the grand monuments and the celebrations of American democracy, there's an unease about the state of the nation. So divided, too divided, and polarized on issues various issues. Yeah, it's just very divided. There's uh, so many topics that were either one side or the other and people aren't uh, super willing to bridge that gap. I think right now we're in a difficult position. Um, there's a lot of discord, a lot of division that I think is being directed by people who have some very radicalized views and really want the country to move backwards instead of forwards in terms of rights. and liberties and equality. It's, just, it's very hard to see and watch and experience at this point in time right now. Compromise, I think, needs to happen. And I think both sides need to be willing to compromise more. Um, and so potentially we need to elect people who are willing to compromise. What are the main problems in America as you see them? Sin. I think sin is the main problem. But I think there's a lot of other things that can counterfeit with that, such as systematic racism and a lot of other things that we consider America. Um, but it's actually the foundational pieces of who we are. You thought systematic racism, how, how big an issue is that for you living here? Well, I'm a black woman in America. Um, so it is a huge issue that we face, but not only do black people face it, but every oppressed group, um, there's systematic issues in every way. The American dream is fading. Inflation is skyrocketing. COVID continues to ravage the US with a per capita death toll four times more than most Western countries. Politicians on both sides are encouraging the discontent. 
President Biden is struggling. His approval rating has fallen to historic lows. Congress is gridlocked and Republicans are on track to seize control of both the House and the Senate in the November midterm elections. And despite all the damaging evidence from the January the 6th hearings, Donald Trump is flirting with another presidential run. On top of all of this, the recent Supreme Court ruling overturning abortion rights has sparked visceral anger. Racism remains deep-seated and systemic. And there seems to be no end to the mass shootings, with more than 300 in the last six months. American democracy has always been a beacon of hope, but it seems the states are far from united. For their unique perspective, I talked to some of Washington's key players. Michael Steele is the former chairman of the Republican National Committee. E.J. Dion is a veteran Washington Post political columnist. Amanda Carpenter is the former communications director for Republican Senator Ted Cruz. And Steve Clemens is a longtime Washington political analyst. I think people have very different worldviews. I think there's a whole set of Americans, you know, they're not all Trumpists, but they're angry and they're frustrated at traditional, conventional, institutional politics that they feel represent uh, interests antithetical to their own, that they feel demeaned, left behind, looked down on uh, by a class of Americans who are wealthy, who maybe went to good schools, who did this. We're, we're having a generational shift and realignment in American politics, and it's around a lot of things. It's about race, it's about income and, and, and many other issues of opportunity in this country. And there's just a deep divide about what it means to be American in this country. And so we have a tug of war over that right now inside our nation. Well, I don't think it's necessarily unique to American politics that fear and anger are often animating factors in politics. But unfortunately, we've had the experience of that being the case here in America for the past four years. That said, there are other values that do come into a political equation with the right candidate um, that does have appeal to stop that. It has to do with love and unity. I mean, I am a Republican. I disagreed with a lot of Barack Obama's politics when he won the election in 2008, but there's no doubt that he represented a, you know, hope and change, optimism, happiness for the future. And so if a winning party can find a way to convey that to voters and say, you know what, things are kind of tough right now. But if we can find our common purpose together and work together towards that to solve these problems, yes, there's absolutely hope. But until someone can do that, fear and anger will win the day. It's a new space for a lot of, a lot of the political operatives and players and elected folks here in town as well. Because uh, in the not too distant past, there was always this, yeah, there's always been the political tensions around policy, you know. Democrats want to, you know, expand government, Republicans want to contract it, right? So that, that's kind of, you know, sort of baseline stuff. Um, but even in those battles, it was never personal. I didn't hate you. You know, it's like, okay, I think you're wrong on this initiative and I'm going to try to fight you, you know, in committee uh, hearings and I'm going to testify against your bill or I'm going to support your bill. But, you know, whatever, we'll have dinner later, right? Now it's a very different environment. It is not only do I uh, not like your bill, I don't like you for proposing it. You are you know, anti-American, fill in the blank. A Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. So it's really, you know, it's how the, both sides are reimagining the American experiment. Well, the partisan divide has been growing steadily for perhaps 30 years. And some of it is simple political science that our parties used to be more diverse ideologically. The Democrats had a lot of conservatives in the South. Now all those conservatives are uh, Republican. The Republicans had a fair number of moderates and progressives in the North. Now most of those voters and politicians are Democrats. So that's the long term. The short term is, I think, Donald Trump uh, and the intense um, anger, division, loyalty, all those things that, um, that he inspires. And it's not surprising that this city is so divided because you see this in families all over the country. If you travel around the country and talk to uh, 
people who used to have vigorous political arguments in their families, they can't even talk politics now. I know so many people uh, who say, you know, I don't talk about politics with my brother-in-law anymore or my sister or what, whatever the division happens to be. Um, and while those divisions have been growing steadily, after all, Bill Clinton got impeached back in the 90s, uh, I think that Trump has created a whole new level of animosity. He may have left the White House 18 months ago, the only president to be impeached twice while in office, and his legacy tarnished by the January the 6th hearings. But Donald Trump still dominates the political conversation in Washington. Tim's he remains the, the clear favourite to win the Republican Party's 2024 presidential nomination. Whether or not Trump does run again for the White House, the Republican Party is well and truly under his spell. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who advocates the same hardline policies as Donald Trump, is seen as another firm contender for the presidency. And there are other hopefuls also striving to out-Trump the former president. So much so that a recent survey by political polling website 538 found 35% of GOP candidates this year for Congress or key state positions like governor continue to falsely claim, like Donald Trump, the 2020 election was stolen by the Democrats. Just last week, election deniers enjoyed a clean sweep in the swing state of Arizona winning the Republican primaries to formally run for Governor, Secretary of State and a seat in the US Senate. As a former chairman of the Republican National Committee, how do you feel about the direction the GOP is taking? It sucks. <laughs> to put it just very bluntly, it sucks. Uh, this is not the party I joined um, back, uh, back when I was a young 17-year-old kid looking to uh, identify politically uh, with um, a party that aligned more with how I was raised and the values that my mama and daddy gave me, uh, who are both Democrats to this day. Um, but as, as my mama, when I, when I told her that I decided to become a Republican, she was like, well, Lord, why would you go do that? I said, it's because you raised me well. Raised me to think for myself. You raised me despite growing up in a segregated city, which Washington, D.C. was at the time. You, you showed me that this country belonged to me too, and it had value for me, and I could achieve whatever goals I set out. So that aligned with the story of a party that you know went beyond just freeing the slaves for me. You know, a lot of Republicans like to trot that out. Yeah, we freed the slaves. Yeah, but what else have we done? What else did we do? We put in place uh, you know, economic and political and other opportunities and rights to secure that promise. Um, and unfortunately, by the time we got to the 1960s, started to walk away from that. But there were those of my, like myself who believed, still believed in those. So it's frustrating today to watch a party step away from those ideals. Do you see a time in the post-Trump era and there will be at some stage a post-Trump era of the Republican Party reverting to the party you, you knew and, and you ran. Uh, no, I don't, to be honest. Uh, and that's disheartening. And so it, it begs the question for Republicans like myself, so when do you leave, right? Um, Have you considered leaving? I get, oh, pff, every day. But I call myself a Motel 6 Republican. Someone's got to keep the lights on. So I, you know, I, I'm on the front porch keeping the lights on, despite the fact that some of these crazies in the party come by and keep blowing out the light bulb, right? Keep knocking it out. But yeah, there, I, I think it becomes harder, Michael, for, for the party to re regain that footing, to re regain that trust with the American people. We embraced white nationalism. We embraced the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters. Um, the KKK, um, Donald Trump said to the world, oh, they're fine people on both sides. They're not. <laughs> I'm sorry, they're not. Um, and a party that cannot explicitly say that, and the only, the best that its political leadership can say is, you know, stand back and stand by. And we saw what happened after that on January 6th. 
Uh, yes, I think Donald Trump has drastically changed what it means to be a Republican. And one of the things that I am really concerned about doesn't necessarily have to do with policy and things like taxes and spending and America's uh, position in, in the world, but just in terms of how we treat each other and how we resolve our internal political differences. Um, one of the things that I, I am actively working on and looking for um, opportunities to capitalize on is what ways can the left work together with center-right disaffected Democrats? Because that's really the coalition that Joe Biden brought together in 2020 that propelled him to a win. Um, he wasn't the preferred candidate of the Democratic base, but the Democrats did make a decision in 2020 to say, who is the person that can beat Donald Trump? Who is the person that can appeal to some Republicans in these key states in order to put him over the top? And so I, I think the Democratic Party has lost sight of that winning combination, um, but nothing clears the mind like elections, and so we'll see what happens. Um, what he's done is he's continued uh, a long-term trend of driving out um, of the party lots of more moderate people uh, who were quite comfortable with the republicanism of, say, George H.W. Bush, um, were reasonably comfortable with Ronald Reagan, uh, but find Trump abhorrent. Um, this is especially true uh, in suburban areas. Uh, in the Northeast and Middle West and, and on the West Coast, um, uh, they are in a way uh, teal independents in your terms who have become Democrats for the most part or independents who tend to vote Democratic. So um, he, is, he has just continued a push of moderates out of the party that began a long time ago. I think the big thing in asking about Donald Trump's popularity, it's as much about Trump's popularity as it is anti-establishment and anti-government sentiment, that they don't want to continue the status quo. And so I do think the circumstances here are fueling a Donald Trump-like character. And that may not be Trump. It could be Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. It could be a number of other people who pick up the mantle from Trump, whether he runs or not. But certainly Trumpism is not just about one man, Donald Trump. All eyes here are firmly focused on the midterm congressional elections in November. The party of the sitting president traditionally gets slammed in the polls, but it could be a particularly bad night for Joe Biden, and it could inject even more instability into the political landscape. If the conventional wisdom does prevail and things like COVID and inflation just hand the election to Republicans and they take come back, back control of the Senate and the House, I do think you can see a scenario where Joe Biden announces he will not run for re-election. Um, that has pros and cons. It has the con in my view because I think he is one of the few Democratic candidates who could keep this left center right coalition together. But on the other hand, it does create opportunities for younger people to get in the game, um, start competing in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, have a lot of attention on the Democratic primaries and have that big robust contest about what the future is on the Democratic side, while on the Republican side, you're probably still going to be talking about Donald Trump. Do you expect the president to run again for a second term? I don't know. I think Joe Biden uh, says he's going to run. Other people have said he's going to run. And we have to, in the media, presume that that is what they think right now. But there are so many factors, including his own behavior, in terms of how he's reaching out. You know, particularly in my view, uh, I, I know the G7 meeting is really, really important, but there's no reason he couldn't have been six or nine hours late for it and have ma you know, organized a massive rally in a place like Louisville, uh, Kentucky, or Little Rock, Arkansas, two states that immediately uh, forbade abortions after over the overturning of the Supreme Court by, of the uh, Roe versus Wade um, abortion, anti-abortion, um, or, or pro-choice uh, 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 provisions in the Supreme Court, that that is such a fundamental political issue in this country, and Joe Biden left the country. So there are certain things like that that seem to be weird and out of place, and of course many people worry about his age uh, and his nimbleness right now. And actually his program and his legislative agenda look paralyzed 
at this moment. So is that person going to run again? I think in his mind he thinks he is. I think there's a lot of doubt around him that he will run again. So an already deeply polarized country could be heading into a period of even greater uncertainty, with both parties potentially on the hunt for new standard bearers in 2024. The big problem for the Democrats is that Vice President Kamala Harris is even more unpopular than Joe Biden. An open contest for the Democratic nomination in 2024 could see the Democrats lurch to the left at the same time as Republicans continue their march to the right. Not only would political discourse sink further, a lot of American voters, those in the middle, could be left with nowhere to go. Well, something else will come. I mean, politics abhors a vacuum, like everything else. So, and I, you know, there are elements of converse, conversations and elements of strategies being put together to create another lane, to give center-right, center-left voters, for example, uh, a space that they can go to. Because as much as people, you know, have you know expressed their disappointment, disdain, and and just you know negative reaction to the Republican Party, Democrats aren't that much better off. So you, you also have that, that piece of uh, the pie as well. So you have a larger and larger swath of vo voters who are sitting there going, where do I go? What do I do? And, and so there are conversations and efforts being pieced together now to create that space. That will take time. It's not something that obviously happens overnight. This isn't the 1860s where you can form a party in you know, 1854 and by 1860 you've you know, you got a candidate who becomes president of the United States in Abraham Lincoln. Um, so this is a very different time. They didn't have Twitter and, <laughs> and Facebook because I contend if they did. Much more gentle times. Yeah, it's much more gentle times. But there's a lot of work ahead, Michael, and, and the party I think has to recon reconcile itself to that work. Given all the challenges the American political system is, is clearly facing, would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist regarding the future of, of the great American democratic experiment? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I, I think things have gotten terribly bad, but I still know that people can come together to make a difference. And for a long time, I've been a never Trump conservative. And even going into the 2020 election, uh, people were still supporting Donald Trump. But after January 6th, it has caused many people to re-examine their choices. And the number one example of that is the woman leading the January 6th hearings right now, Liz Cheney. She voted for Donald Trump in November 2020. She was a member of Republican leadership. But she has changed her mind. And if someone like her can change her mind, I am certain more people can. I don't want to be a Pollyanna and say there's nothing to worry about. Yes, there's something to worry about. But I would say at the end of the day, I have confidence that the system, if we safeguard it now, will largely prevent those outcomes from happening. Because in the end, that person, that individual, even in some of these states, is in a political minority. Um, even if you kind of look at the broad public and say, OK, how much of that broad public is fanatically obsessed with the ascension again of Donald Trump and it's just not that great. So at the end of the day the antibodies in the system are lar I think will will protect it uh, but it doesn't mean that that system can't get sick in the process. I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist uh, and uh, we have three kids in their 20s. I always tell them that when my generation is gone and they take over, I think we'll be better off. They're less divided. There's more social tolerance. Uh, and the only problem with my prediction is I want to be around to see that country. What I think is we've got to get through about 10 hard years. I see <clears throat> the next decade as really challenging because I don't see these divisions easing quickly. Uh, I think that the pressure on democracy, both here and in many other uh, long-time democratic countries, is enormous. And so I think if we get through the next 10 years, I think we'll be fine. But it's going to be a hard go for a while. Back down on the National Mall, there's certainly concern and anxiety about the future, but also a fair sprinkling of hope. Short-term pessimists long-term undecided. Pessimist. 
very bit pessimist. I don't know. <laughs> Just doesn't nothing really seems that great. Like so far, I don't see any reason for it to think it would improve. Sadly. Are you worried about the country's future at all? Um, I'm hopeful. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's it's got its issues for sure. But seeing you know my fellow Americans here today on these at these sites at these special sites, it renews my spirit that they can rise. There are many inscriptions on the walls at these various uh, exhibits and monuments, and they're also uplifting. Everyone needs to um, just go back to sound, soundness and sensibility. Do you see that happening? Maybe in tiny, tiny increments in certain places, but overall, no right now. But Overall only happens when it starts in tiny, tiny increments. So we just have to keep trying. Getting America back on track will indeed take a lot of effort. Which way this country does move in the months and years ahead is difficult to discern. Will a contested 2024 election results with a more forceful pushback from the loser see this vibrant democracy really tear itself apart? Or will Americans manage to shake off the current turmoil and embrace a brighter future? This has long been a country brimming with confidence and opportunity. Every last reserve of this sunny optimism may be needed to get through what is likely to be an exceedingly challenging couple of years.